Father Victor, recently you visited Kiev, Ukraine. Why did you you, you decided uh, to go there? It's uh, not very good time, winter. Well, uh, no, it's not. It was probably the worst time of the year to go, uh, end of January, beginning of February. We went for eight days. And for the eight days that we spent in Kiev, we never once saw the sun. It, the temperature was hovering in the, the area like between 27 and 34. So it was uh, freezing and then melting, freezing again, and very, very slippery, very foggy. But um, the reason we went is... Um, Matushka and I, uh, is we had this inner urge uh, after hearing all these um, troubling news reports about the, um, I would say, repression of, of the canonical church uh, in Ukraine, the church that it, which is headed by Metropolitan Anufri of Kiev and all Ukraine, We just had this urge to to go and uh, uh, show our support for Vladika. We we met Vladika years ago. He this was even before the um, reunification of the uh, Russian Orthodox Church abroad and Moscow Patriarchate. Vladika came uh, to our cathedral here in Washington. Uh, he was just visiting friends, and he came and uh, attended vigil and. Um, uh, He refused any kind of signs of honor, which we usually uh, show bishops, uh, metropolitans. He stood in the altar as a simple monk, prayed uh, throughout the whole vigil. And then he came a second time in uh, 2007, uh, when um, then Father Tikhon Shivkunov, now Metropolitan Tikhon of Skov, uh, Shivkunov brought the reigning icon of the Mother of God and Metropolitan Anufri was part of the uh, small delegation that came to celebrate the uh, reunification. And then I met him several times later and uh, what strikes me uh, about Metropolitan Anufri, he is uh, authentic. <clears throat> He's a humble monk, uh, someone who um, you can just sense that he prays all the time. And uh, so we had this urge, and we went to Kiev, um, and uh, we asked for a blessing before we went. I wrote him a letter, and he, uh, his secretary wrote back and said that Valika would be pleased to see us. And um, we had uh, an audience with him in his, uh, in his office. He spoke with us uh, for about an hour and a half, which was really an honor for us because uh, being under all the pressure that he is at the present time, it was amazing that he devoted so much time to us. And we had a very frank conversation. We expressed our admiration for him and for his church. We told him that we uh, are, are praying for him and his flock. And uh, we asked him questions about the situation in, in um, Ukraine, about the situation of the church in Ukraine. And um, he answered and he uh, basically said that uh, his position is uh, to be patient. Uh, his uh, message to his people is uh, be loyal citizens of, of, the, of your country, love your country. Uh, but uh, most importantly, be loyal to your church, be loyal to Christ. And um, I mean, that's the message he preaches in, in churches, and you can see that in the internet. He uh, never talks about politics. Uh, he always underscores the importance of being true to Christ and, and uh, true to keeping the unity of the church. Of course, um, he could not but express uh, his dismay at uh, the actions of the ecumenical patriarch in granting um, so-called autocephaly to two schismatic groups 
uh, in Ukraine and forming a new structure, a new church structure, which, by the way, has not been recognized by any other of the uh, 14 Orthodox churches of the world. Uh, they all continue to commemorate Metropolitan Anufri in the liturgy. This is very important uh, for us to understand. And he also explained to us that uh, what is happening um, with the church in, in, in Ukraine is not a local matter. It's not a matter between Russia, Ukraine, and the Ecumenical Patriarch. It's a matter that concerns the entire Orthodox world because uh, the question of unity is at stake. And, and for the Church, unity is of utmost importance. That was the uh, last thing that Christ prayed about in the Garden of Gethsemane before his crucifixion. He said, Lord, may they be one as we are one uh, when he was praying to, to, to his Father. Um, Metropolitan Anufri invited me to serve, concelebrate with him the liturgy the next Sunday after we met uh, in the uh, main church of the Kiev Caves, Lavra. And that was also a wonderful experience because I was, uh, as being a senior priest, I was able to stand near uh, Metropolitan Anufri at, in the altar. And the service was magnificent. It was dynamic, very prayerful. There were three other bishops, multitude of, of, of um, priests and deacons, and of course the, the church was overflowing. And you can sense the devotion of the people uh, to Metropolitan Anofri. They love him. And um, I was told that uh, in, during the evening service uh, at the end of Matins, uh, he would, before the beginning of the first hour, he would start walking out towards the entrance of the church. Um, it would take him a half hour because people would surround him and ask for a blessing. So by the time he got to the front of the church, or I should say the, the, the entrance to the church at the back, uh, it would take him a half hour. Um, we, at the end of liturgy, Sunday, February 3rd, um, Bodhika uh, had to leave the church from the altar door because he needed to fly to a city to visit a diocese. And uh, I went out on the balcony and I watched him uh, going down the steps and uh, there were already people in the back. There were probably people in the front too waiting for him to come out, but he, there were already people lined up in the back and there were people rushing from the front of the church to the back of the church to the altar. And of course, Ludika couldn't bless every single person, so he took his walking staff and he touched people's heads with his walking staff. And people just wanted to touch the, 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 the hem of his garment. Uh, he is so beloved. So that was, that was a marvelous to, 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 um, to observe. Uh, and during our meeting, Ludika uh, gave me this beautiful cross as a token of... Um, uh, as a remembrance, and the, the back is uh, his uh, bishop's emblem. So I, this is the cross that I will always cherish. Um, so that was a wonderful meeting, and, and basically the message that Velika uh, passed on to us, to me and Matushka, was uh, basically the same message he uh, preaches in the churches. Um, of course, he's... Uh, very saddened by the fact that uh, priests are being called in by the Secret Service for interrogations that um, parishes in the um, countryside are being forced to join this new schismatic church structure, uh, that there's vandalism going on. And, um, well, he said we have to pray. He says that uh, during times of troubles, uh, the best in the church comes out. That, you know, people show heroics uh, in the worst of times. Um, so, and I think that is truly the case because uh, in the past several months, we have uh, heard and seen uh, wonderful 
bishops coming out and speaking their mind uh, in Ukraine and, and priests and uh, uh, people uh, coming and, and saying what they think and what they believe. Uh, so the church, the canonical church in Ukraine is not politicized. It's, it's trying its best to be true to Christ. Uh, you also, you mentioned Kiev Kiev's uh, lover. You also uh, met with uh, its uh, abbot, Metropolitan Pope. Uh, what can you tell about uh, this uh, uh, meeting? And then, um, what's, uh, what's your impression? Can uh, schismatics really seize uh, uh, this? Uh, I believe um, most important uh, uh, monastery of the Russian Orthodox Church. Yes, the key of caves, Lavra in in Kiev is of course truly one of the most important and central monasteries uh, for Russians and Ukrainians. This is where Russian monasticism was born. Uh, Saint Anthony of the Key of Caves was is the founder of Russian monasticism, and um, I mean this is a a place that all Orthodox Christians need to visit at least once in their life. Uh, it, this complex, uh, large monastery is a little city in itself, and uh, uh, there are this is the resting place of of, of dozens of saints uh, whose bodies are preserved uh, and the caves are in immaculate condition uh, and you can go and, and you can venerate they're built into the walls of, of these caves the bodies of these saints Ilya Muromitz uh, Agapit the doctor uh, Saint Anthony Saint Theodosius uh, also Metropolitan Vladimir of Kiev, who was the first hierarch to be killed in 19, I believe, 18, during the uh, proceedings of the Russian uh, Council of 1917-1918. He's also uh, buried there. And um, before we met with Metropolitan uh, Paul, I was actually not even... Uh, sure that we would meet with him because he he had a hernia operation mm -hmm. and he was out of commission uh, and f the, the next the last day before we left uh, we were able to meet him but before we met him uh, our parishioners here in Washington gave me um, thousands of names to be commemorated uh, at the holy places in, in Kiev uh, and first and foremost, of course, the key of case monitors. I had a stack like like this. And uh, uh, Matushka, I and Mother Theodosia, uh, she is a nun in the key of caves monastery. Uh, she's a friend of my Matushka from, from childhood, from Paris. Uh, the three of us uh, went to the caves. We were fortunate because we went into the caves after the closing, after the official closing, uh, because... There were always tourists and pilgrims there, and we got special blessing to go into the caves when there was nobody there. So we could slowly and prayerfully read all these names, and it was a wonderful experience. I mean, uh, usually the caves, there are many, many people or groups coming coming and going, but here we were all, the caves were all to ourselves. Um, of course, my dream was to serve liturgy there, but... Uh, it didn't happen this time, but maybe next time we'll go for a longer period of time and I'll be able to serve liturgy. But uh, anyway, Mother the Theodosia uh, was able to arrange a meeting uh, for us with Met Metropolitan Paul in his, uh, in his office um, uh, just two days before we left. And uh, uh, I knew him bef previously because um, our parish, about six years ago, received uh, many of the relics of the Kiev uh, Caves saints that are now housed in our 
in our parish, and uh, he gave the final blessing to, for us to receive these relics. Velika Paul is a very outspoken person. Uh, he is not afraid to share what is on his mind. He's very straightforward. Uh, uh, we, we say a straight shooter. Uh, I think his name is mentioned uh, in uh, the Asaist Miratvoritz, which is a, a strange name for uh, enemies list, but Miratvoritz means uh, uh, peacemaker. Mm-hmm. Um, but Vodika, Vodika's residence has been searched uh, by the authorities. Uh, That's all long ago, yes? No, about maybe a month ago, maybe a month and a half ago. Um, the Key of Caves, uh, Lavra, uh, has been officially searched. Uh, they're trying to pin on Metropolitan Paul that antiques have gone missing. But I can tell you that, um, and I've heard this from, from Metropolitan Paul himself, that um, since 1988, when the Lavra was returned to the church and opened for the first time, uh, the monks there, there are about 200 of them, have, if anything, they have added treasures to the Lavra. They have, they have kept it in, in good working order. I mean, you go there and you'll see that the Lavra is in, in perfect shape. So they're trying to find things to pin on him. Of course, he's under a lot of pressure, and his hernia operation that he had is probably because, I, I suspect it could be because of stress. It's not easy. First of all, it's not easy being an administrator of such a wonderful central monastery, which has to deal with many, many things. And now they have to deal with, uh, with uh, this, this pressure on the, uh, from, from, from nationalists, from, uh, from uh, the, 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 these activists from the new church structure. So, what can I say? I mean, I really can't uh, confide, I mean, op- open what our conversation was with the Kabbalah, but basically he told me that, yes, uh, it's true that uh, the, the church is being uh, subjugated to pressure uh, by, as he said, orthodox atheists. You know, they say, mm-hmm. yes, I'm an atheist, but I'm orthodox. You know, people who don't understand anything about the church. So it's, uh, it's sad, but Vodika Paul was very gracious and he invited us to come back uh, any time and that we would be housed at, at the Lavra. What do, what do you think? Is it real, uh, the situation, when we will get the situation like Soviet-era times, when the church is under um, significant Uh, pressure uh, when uh, uh, somebody uh, may seize monastery like uh, Lavra uh, and uh, to um, and uh, uh, maybe some I don't want to say violence but some f- fights. What is your what is your personal impression after you visiting visit? Well, uh, it's not a, a question of personal opinion. It's, it's a fact that uh, churches are being uh, taken away from the canonical church, especially in the countryside. Uh, and people who have, for example, in, in many uh, uh, villages and towns, uh, the mayors who are dependent upon the government Uh, call meetings, and they ask uh, uh, townspeople, uh, many of them who have nothing to do with, with the churches, they don't go to church, but they come together in, in like a town hall meeting, and the mayor says, well, we have a new church, now we have to vote uh, to change our church allegiance from the church of Metropolitan Lufi to the church of the so-called Metropolitan Epiphany. And which, this, is, this is ridiculous because uh, it's like we have our church meeting here last Sunday, um, or two Sundays ago, I'm sorry, and uh, the people who voted the meeting are people who are members of the parish. 
uh, people can come out from the outside, although they live in our neighborhood, and, and vote at our annual assembly. That's, that's just unethical. It's, it's illegal. But this is what's being done in, in, uh, in, in Ukraine. Um, clergy are being called into the SBU, the, um, the, the, the Ukrainian KGB, if you will, and uh, interrogated. And of course, the chief prize are two lavras, two monasteries, the Kiev Caves and uh, the Pachayev Lavra in western Ukraine. Uh, these are the, the two main monasteries that, that, that these uh, radicals want to take over. Um, there have been vandalisms uh, of churches in, in U of, of the canonical churches of uh, parishes in Ukraine. So it's a fact. And just recently, um, one of the bishops of the canonical church, Bishop Gideon Harun, his last name, uh, he is the abbot of the uh, monastery, the Thaids, in uh, Kiev, Dissitinny uh, Monastery in Russian. Uh, he came just what, a week ago to Washington and met with uh, congressmen and uh, told them these facts that I just told you about the uh, repression of the canonical church. He came back to the airport in Kiev. He was stripped, literally stripped of his Ukrainian citizenship and sent out of the country. His passport was, was confiscated. Now, Fortunately, he, he had a dual citizenship, Ukrainian and American, because uh, his parents emigrated to the United States in 19, 1992, and uh, through, through, through his parents he received American citizenship. And he even served in the, American, uh, in the Orthodox Church in America for a while. And then he came, went back to Ukraine, became a bishop in the canonical church and an abbot of this monastery. So this is the latest uh, appalling development of uh, this uh, new church structure being formed in the Ukraine. You also visited Galaseevskaya Pustin. What about uh, this part of your trip? The Galaseevskaya Hermitage, or Pustin, uh, is a, a wonderfully renovated monastery uh, just outside of Kiev. And um, Uh, this place is, is famous for two people. Uh, one is Saint uh, Alexis Golosievsky, uh, a wonderful status elder uh, who lived uh, before the revolution and died in 1917, and a very, very great spiritual figure. His relics were uh, discovered years ago, and he was, uh, not, he was canonized by the Ukrainian Orthodox Church. We went there to uh, to venerate his relics, and also uh, a wonderful uh, a woman saint. Uh, she hasn't been canonized yet, but uh, she's a fool for Christ, Yurodjeva, Yurodjeva Alipia. Um, and I have to say that uh, it was, as I said before at the beginning, that it was cold and slippery, and, but I was surprised that uh, we were there in the evening. And there were hundreds of people coming and going, particularly to uh, to Alipia. Uh, as I said, she yet she's not yet canonized, but um, uh, Matushka and I have great uh, respect and love for her, and we took all those um, commemorations that we we read at the Key of Caves, Lavra, and we read them also at the relics of Saint uh, Alexis and. Uh, and uh, the blessed Alipia, uh, who is buried there as well. Her house was not too far from Golosievsky uh, Hermitage. So that was a wonderful uh, experience as, as well. And our guide uh, was uh, Olga Tireshinka. Uh, she's a wonderful woman who lived in Washington for four or five years. Her, son, uh, her son-in-law, uh, Vladimir Ushko, was attached to the, he's a diplomat, attached to the uh, Amer uh, Ukrainian embassy here in Washington. And he and his family were uh, very uh, uh, 
good parishioners of our, of our cathedral here in Washington. So we have, uh, we have a long-standing friendship. They left about 10 years ago, but she um, is a very pious woman, and she went with us, and she showed us around, and it was a wonderful experience. Um, so we also did a lot of shopping for the parish. We bought vestments and uh, things for our church kiosk. Uh, we spent a lot of time on that, and uh, uh, our hosts in Ukraine were uh, was a priest from Paris, Father Alexis Struve. Uh, he is with the uh, Russian Archdiocese of Western Europe, and uh, he happens to be a French diplomat at the same time. So we stayed in his lovely apartment, and we had a wonderful uh, fellowship with him and his, uh, his Matushka. Uh, of secular things that I did in uh, Kiev was I visited, uh, on the last day of our stay, I visited the Dom Turbinich, uh, the house of the Turbins, which is was made famous by Bulgakov's um, uh, novel, Dni uh, Turbinich, which uh, recalls the uh, tumultuous time of the revolution and the the, the civil war which uh, was fought in uh, in Ukraine in the early 19, 1919 or something. It was a wonderful museum. His, 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 Bulgakov lived in this house for several years and I uh, visited the house I just because I enjoy reading uh, uh, Bulgakov's uh, works and um, it was a wonderful opportunity to visit. Of course, uh, Bulgakov house is at the bottom of a steep hill mm-hmm. uh, and it's called the Andreevsky Spusk because uh, at the top of the hill is the beautiful uh, Baroque St. Andrew's Cathedral uh, which was built in the 18th century, a beautiful structure if you like Baroque. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, so you had to walk down the hill and it was very treacherous because of the, of the icy conditions. But uh, it was an interesting um, uh, experience. And I have to say that uh, people in Kiev are very friendly, uh, very friendly. And um, uh, we never experienced any hostility. Um, and the city is beautiful, even in, in the fog and the snow. It's, it's a wonderfully beautiful city. Uh, by, the, by the way, what people uh told you what do they feel uh, when they learn that you are a priest uh, of Russian church from America? Well, they were delighted. Uh, they, were, they were surprised, they were delighted, uh, not only by the fact that I was a Russian priest from America, but I was a, I'm a Russian priest who basically grew up in America. Never spent, never lived in in Russian Russia or Ukraine, and uh, my mother and I often would tell these people that uh, we are uh, Russian Ukrainian Americans, yes. because my mother is Ukrainian. She's from Eastern Ukraine, Holik, her last name, and my wife's uh, uh, mother's uh, family is also from Ukraine, Rodzianko. So we, they were delighted to hear that and uh, of course uh, we, we told them that you know we we for us uh, Ukraine is just as dear to our hearts as, as Russia is because of our family connections and of course because of the spiritual connections mm-hmm. because Kiev is the is the mother of all Russian towns and uh, the place where Kiev and Rus uh, was was baptized and where we received our uh, spiritual uh, uh, enlightenment. In your uh, in your travel day, day books, uh, you shared with us the stories that you met uh, full for Christ uh, people. Can you tell uh, about this uh, experience? It's very interesting for me. Well, it was a semi-humorous experience. Uh, as I mentioned several times in our conversation, it was icy and cold, and it was hard to navigate the 
uh, hilly hills of, uh, of Kiev and particularly of the Lavra. Because when you enter the Lavra, you have to go down a steep hill and go back up. And um, we were visiting someone at the Lavra and I asked, well, uh, is there a shortcut to get back up to the hill without having to climb the hill? And uh, a lady said, oh yes, you can go this way. And um, uh, I, I sort of remembered that way because I've, I've been to the Lavra before. And, uh, but it just so happened that uh, the steps she was talking about that I had to climb, they were full of icy snow. Uh, so I couldn't walk up the, the steps, so I had to uh, scurry up a hill, a snowy hill. A, um, and So I had, was walking in my, my cassock, and I had, my shoes were not meant for snow. So I was going up this hill, Matushka's already up the hill, and I, I fell on my, my hands and I started sliding down. And out of nowhere, it seemed to me, like out of nowhere, <clears throat> this very shabbily dressed gentleman who I, may Lord forgive me, I took him, I thought he was a drunk, you know, inebriated individual. Uh, he just, out of, the, out of the blue, I saw his face. He was smiling and said, Batyushka, let me give you a hand. And he gave me his hand and I, I, I grabbed it and uh, I thought, well, now he's going to fall on me. We're going to tumble down the hill together. Uh, but he grabbed my hand and he pulled me very hard and I, he pulled me up the hill. And um, well, I, I thanked him and he looked, uh, uh, well, he looked, he looked like he was a fool for Christ. Uh, he looked, it was very uh, dressed shabbily, as I said, and very thinly dressed, although it was cold. And we just started walking with him up the, uh, the sidewalk, and we had, were, were having a, con a very intelligent conversation. Uh, he was very well versed in Ukrainian politics and church politics, and uh, I thought he would ask for money, but he didn't. We come up, came up the hill, uh, he said goodbye, and just went, and Matryoshka stopped him, of course, and gave him some money. And then uh, the last Sunday we were there, when we were serving liturgy with Metropolitan Anufri, uh, he, he appeared again, came up for my blessing, and uh, his name was Vasily. And uh, I'm just uh, sorry that I didn't get to know him better, but he, again, he just took my blessing and said goodbye and left. And uh, so I'm <laughs> grateful to him for for saving my neck, for from falling down, um, and I'm sorry that I just didn't uh, get to know more about him. Uh, what interesting fellow. So what did you learn from uh, talking with him? Well, not nothing in particular. I mean, he was, uh, he was just very critical of uh, the ecumenical patriarch. Uh, so he, he was definitely uh, someone who supported Metropolitan Nofri. Mm -hmm. I mean, without going into detail. Mm -hmm. uh, you visited Ukraine before. You were, uh, you were there <coughs> a couple of weeks ago. Uh, what differences did you find? And what constant things did you, did, did you find? first time I was in Ukraine was in 1988. I was there in official capacity. I was a correspondent for the Voice of America covering the celebration of the millennium of Christianity in Russia. And after the central celebrations in Moscow, uh, the large delegation that was there from the West was offered the opportunity to go to St. Petersburg, to Pskov, and to Kiev in, in separate groups. And I chose to go to Kiev. Uh, and because in 1988, the, the Lavra was returned to the church, and the very first liturgy was served in the Lavra, and I didn't want to miss that. Uh, that was in the summertime in July. 
for Saint Vladimir's Day. Very good t- uh, time uh, to visit Kiev. Well, uh, much, much better than the end of January for sure. And of course, Kiev struck me then as a beautiful green city, many trees, lovely, lovely city. I didn't uh, get to meet very many people. We were just there for a few days. And then we went uh, again about six years ago to receive the relics of the Kiev Caves saints. Um, Again, it was a wonderful time. I think we went in uh, spring. Um, this time, I, I f- again, it's hard to, to judge, but because it was cold and foggy and raining sometimes, snowing sometimes, but it seemed to me that parts of Kiev were run, run down more than before. Uh, we noticed um, there were soup kitchens set up in certain parts of the city to feed senior citizens, the handicapped, because they're having a very difficult time right now. Uh, Maybe uh, uh, you would like uh, to share with us something what I didn't ask you. I think we covered everything, uh, more or less. I I didn't have a chance to, you know, when I was in Kiev, I I made an effort to uh, write a travelogue. Uh, I wrote seven of them. Uh, during the eight days we were there, it, it uh, took some effort because we were it was exhausting. All the all the days were full of uh, events and um, activities, and but I tr- I tried to keep our parishioners um, abreast of what we were doing. Um, so I, but before we before our conversation, I didn't have a chance to read over my travel logs. It was just, Today is the meeting of the Lord Feast, and uh, it was very, very busy. I had a, I had a, a funeral to do, and uh, um, so I. But besides what I already told you, I would ask uh, the our viewers to keep Ukraine in in their prayers, uh, particularly the the believers of Ukraine who are being used by politicians. Um, for their own advantage. Uh, the whole establishment of the this new church structure headed by so-called Metropolitan Epiphany is a political project from beginning to end. Uh, this is not the way a church is formed. This is not the way f- for people to Uh, worship the Lord in an artificial structure. The Church of uh, Metropolitan Lofi is a canonical church recognized by the entire world as the only canonical church in Ukraine. It has apostolic succession. It is totally free in its internal uh, life. And this new church church structure, which was advertised as an autocephalous church, which means an independent church, is in truth not independent. If you read this, the, the so-called Thomas, which was given by uh, Met, uh, Patriarch Bartholomew to Metropolitan Epiphany and to, I should say, to, to President Poroshenko, because this was his brainchild, um, you'll see that the church, the his, this new church, or so-called church, is totally dependent upon Patriarch Bartholomew. Totally dependent on him. So it's not an autocephalous church at all. But what did you find from, let's say, from the street? Is uh, this so-called church really popular in uh, in Ukraine, or, uh, what, uh, or it's only uh, popular in their government? Well, uh, I, I, I can't, I didn't take a poll of people, but it, it, my sense was it, it is not popular, uh, and it is made up of two formerly schismatic groups, met, uh, Patriarch Filaret Genisienko's group, and uh, the other Patriarch Mikhail, I think his name was, who came together, but they're having internal problems. They, they, they can't work out their differences. 
Philaret still considers himself a patriarch, which is going to cause a lot of problems between him and Epiphany and Bar Patriarch Bartholomew. Uh, so it's uh, it it they're they're going to I my projection is that uh, they're going to suffer a lot of internal strife, which will probably bring this church down. I don't think it's going to work. Uh, it's you know it reminds me of the 1920s in Russia when the Bolsheviks realized that they cannot break the the back of Patriarch Tikhon's church, the canonical church. So the Bolsheviks uh, organized a church structure which became known as the Living Church or the Renovationists, who were made of made up of radical. Uh, priests who supported the communist regime and they tried to break the canonical church from within. And I think this is the same thing that's happening to a certain degree in Ukraine. There's a canonical church which is made up of over 12,000 parishes all over, the, all over the country. And there's a schismatic group which is being used by the government for its own political ends. The renovationist church in Russia didn't work. It broke up because it was not supported by the people. And I think the exact same thing will eventually happen with the church, with Metropolitan uh, Epiphany's church. Because it is not being supported by the vast majority of Orthodox believers in Ukraine, and it certainly hasn't been uh, supported by the other local Orthodox churches of the world, N none of the churches sent him congratulations on his election and elevation, and no one from the other local churches, except for Constantinople, had representatives at his inauguration. Uh, let's try to imagine something unrealistic, that somebody from that so-called church comes to Washington, D.C., to our cathedral will you agree to meet to meet uh, these to talk with these uh, people and what you would tell them well we need to talk to everyone you know we have to be always prepared to give an answer for our faith now, of course if somebody comes a so-called priest or a bishop I'll show him the church mm -hmm. I'll talk to him but I won't allow him to serve He's, 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 he can stand in, in the church with the faithful and pray with us, but not, not can celebrate. Mm. Absolutely not. Thank you very much, Father Victor.